I have been searching. Welcome to Following the Fire. Thanks for joining us on this journey through the wilderness. Just like Israel followed the pillar of fire and smoke, we want to take a new look at our beliefs and just follow him. And like Israel, we get it wrong a lot, we get lost a lot, but we're doing our best to to go where God leads us. I'm Nathan. And I'm Steve. Don't you know it's all I have? Well, welcome to the Following the Fire Book Club, uh, episode two, which is really episode 15, but it's episode two of the Book Club. We have a guest today. Yeah, so um, Nicole McGlore is, is joining us. Uh, we're really excited. Nicole is a friend of a friend of a friend, basically. Um, and I we've maybe met once or twice, but I got hooked on your blog, Give the Grave Only Bones. And I was kind of tricked into it because there was a post about maybe your wedding, um, which was a interesting and exciting story. And so you hooked me with that, uh, but then it turned into this just very timely voice during 2020 that had nothing to do with uh, Christian w- weddings or whatever I was I, I got hooked on so I've been I've been a following give the grave only bones the the blog but also your Facebook page is just you know fire all the time I I realized Facebook gives out these badges for if you're like a, a follower and I got offered a badge and then I was I, I got shy and I was like I should <laughs> I should back Top off a little fan. bit because <laughs> uh, it's like it felt like literal Facebook stalking, but, may, you know, um, very great content. So we're very honored to have you. Welcome to Following the Fire. And yeah, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited. It's my first podcast. If someone would have told me my first podcast would be with two white men I've never met, I would have been like, <laughs> you know. I don't really believe you, but here we are. <laughs> oh, that's great. So, um, yeah, my name is Nicole McGlure. I am, gosh, I was told I could talk about my faith journey. And where do I start? So I'm originally from Maryland. I grew up in a town right outside of Washington, D.C. called Suitland, Maryland. And I grew up Seventh-day Pentecostal, which Seventh-day Pentecostal is... Uh, like the commandment church is what they call it. And it's really a charismatic preaching choir, Holy ghost fire type of thing. Mm. (laughs) And I grew up um, not eating pork, not eating shellfish, observing the Sabbath, observing the Passover every year and like Lord's supper. We only did it once a year though. We didn't do Lord's supper every week. Um, Mm. I grew up thinking that all my friends that ate pork were going to hell. And that was interesting, being like, hey, you better eat pepperoni pizza because you're going to go to hell. But they, I don't think they are anymore. And I also grew up with a lot of female pastors. Um, lots of my parents came to faith under a female pastor. And so, like, Pentecostal faith is very conservative in some ways in regards to what you eat and observing the Sabbath and those things. But in other ways, it's really what we would call now progressive. So I never really thought about like women not being in leadership or um, I grew up around pretty much all black people. So I never really thought about like black people not being in leadership in churches and in all churches in where I was. Like every church was all black people and everyone in leadership and it was like half women. (laughs) So my faith, I think I grew up in some ways thinking like, these really radical, like, oh, those people eating that shrimp, they're going to die in the Nazi season. <laughs> <laughs> and then other ways, like, yeah, all women leading and women preachers and, you know, black people in power, in, not in power, but black people in leadership. That was kind of how I grew up. And then when I was like 16, my parents did this real deep Romans dive and they were like, whoa, grace. Uh, we have been doing this thing wrong and my life like completely changed. <laughs> really? They, uh, we still went to a Saturday church, but we didn't observe the Sabbath anymore. We started eating pork. We started eating shellfish. We started watching movies on Friday nights. We started being able to hang out with our friends on Friday nights. And it was really amazing, actually, because my parents taught me like, you can believe something wholeheartedly, but then when you feel like God shows you that it's wrong, let it go and move on. And who cares if you told everybody that was the truth? 
it's not that you don't believe it anymore. So move on. And um, hmm. wow. yeah, that was really incredible. And I think that's helped me in some ways to be a little loose handed. I think some people would disagree, but I try to be loose handed with some of my values. If I find out that it's wrong, I'm going to just let it go and move on. And who cares? Um, after high school, I went to an all women's college. And that was like the first time I was ever around people who were in like same sex relationships. <laughs> and mm. that completely rocked my world. I went to, to college as like a anti-abortion, you know, heterosexual relationships, people need to go to church. And then I left college thinking a lot of different things that my parents probably <laughs> have a lot of feelings about, but I just thought yeah. completely different things. And then I, after that, I worked abroad for three and a half years. So I worked in over 22 different countries, lived with over 100 wow. different host families, and that really impacted the way I think about the world and think about faith. Um, long story short, then I moved to Denver, helped plan a church, then decided that that church was not doing good things anymore, got married, moved to Pennsylvania, and now I am <laughs> writing a lot of things, blogging, doing things on social media, talking about race and the church and the part the church plays in social justice. And I think the opportunity the church has to be a really strong voice in what's going on in the world. And I talk a lot about white supremacy and white evangelicals. And I try and do it all in love. But I'm sure I miss the mark sometimes. But yeah. That's like a big overarching umbrella of Nicole McGlure. Well, that's a lot. That was amazing. <laughs> that was amazing. I was gonna that was amazing. Uh, I was gonna say I, I grew up getting to eat pepperoni pizza, but with no women leadership and and all white people in the church. And I feel like I got the wrong end of that trade. I think you, you got it pretty good. <laughs> the pepperoni pizza is really good. <laughs> I don't. I don't like pizza, but yeah, that I, I've heard that. Wait, what? I don't like, yeah, I don't, I don't like pizza. Oh, you don't know this? We're, we're, it's like the up, most, like defining, that that... most defining thing <laughs> about me is that I don't like pizza, which practically makes me a communist. Yeah. Wow. I'm going to have to rethink yeah. this podcast, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Un unequally yoked. Um, <laughs> So the the book that we uh, we have for the for the podcast today is um, "Why We Can't Wait" by uh, Martin Luther King Jr. And this is actually a book that Nicole re uh, recommended for us to read, and I am so thankful you did. Holy cow! I'll get to that, <laughs> get to that later. But um, just to kind of get an overview for people who maybe who haven't read it yet, um, don't think that this uh, absolves you from reading the book. You have to go read the book. Uh, but high level over you, it's it's kind of a it's it was written by by uh, by him in 1964, which uh, my calculations tell me it's like around 57 years ago, mm -hmm. which has been a while. It's kind of part firsthand history book, uh, part philosophy and vision setting, which is something Dr. King was fantastic at, and um, and it centers around the 1963 Birmingham campaign, which is. As, he's, as he says, it's seen as kind of the beginning of the quote-unquote Negro Revolution in the 60s. And in that campaign, King was an unjustly arrested along with many other black people, and which is when he wrote the well-known letter from Birmingham Jail, which is a, a big part of the book. And through his retelling of what happened, he also explains why it is when, when black people have been oppressed for centuries, why 1963? What happened? What was kind of the, the defining moments which I found fascinating, and and the reasoning behind the use of nonviolent protests, which is which is great to hear about as well. So, like I said, thank you, Nicole, for recommending this book. Uh, I can't believe I've never read it myself. It seems like something that it should be required reading for every student in America. <laughs> but can can you start us off by just telling us what this book means to you and why you wanted to recommend it to us? Yeah, for sure. I think that was a great overview, Steve. Um, I read this book just for the first time last year, and I read it for the first time in March. And since I just finished my third time reading it, 
And I read it out of this kind of desperation for surely the church can play a bigger part than it has, right? There was kind of this like yearning in my heart for like, surely I am not on the wrong side of history with this deep desire I have for as a Christian who like as much as I deconstruct my faith, like my love for Christ is just grow stronger. So as a Christian, surely we were meant to play a bigger part in this. And I can't be the only person who is like, hey, Christians should be doing things. And so this book was on my bookshelf and I read it and then I kind of said, I need to sit on this for a few months. <laughs> and I read it and I yeah. just put it back on the shelf. <laughs> like, I can't do <laughs> that right now. And then I read it again and I was doing this like series on my social media where I was posting videos about books I read. And I read that book and I'm like, wow, I read it in September after everything that happened last summer. Mm. And I read it and I'm like, wow, we could easily replace 2020. Where everywhere it says 1963, we could easily put, replace it with 2020 easily right like this is a perfect uh catalyst for this revolution or this these protests and all these things that happen so for me it was this really affirming uh validating book of like you what you're seeing for one is not new which is kind of discouraging it's not new it's been happening a very long time and your desire to be a believer playing a part in the change and not just saying prayers and sending people on mission trips to other countries know what's going on in your own country in your own streets like actually being out there pastors were doing that ministers were doing that missionaries were doing that uh, elders were doing that christians were filling the streets black christians were filling the streets advocating for their rights and the rights of people in other towns and me seeing so many Christians being like, well, we really just need to be focusing on Jesus. We need to be just focusing on, you know, people being uh, drawn to Christ. We need to just, if, once we do that, then everything else will fall in place. Like, actually, that's never happened. It's never happened. Yeah. And um, reading this book, gosh, it's hard to really say all it means to me because it was that affirming. And I think when you're a black Christian who's really engaged in both, Right, like really engaged in the church. I've been in the church my whole life. I love church. I love church. I'm a big church guy, right? Love church. And I love justice. Like I mm. I am yeah. fiercely passionate about speaking out against injustice, not only for things that impact my life, but things that impact other people. And if they're both from God, then why are, where is the connection coming from? Like where's the connection gonna come? Why is there such a disconnect that I see in society with the people who are Christians and the people who are fiercely passionate about injustice. Why is there not a connection? This is a reminder that there has been and there is a connection, but just, I guess, the people who are loudest now and who are most in the forefront are not doing that work. Circling all that back around to say, when I read it again this time, I was, one, reminded of, like, you're not alone in this. You are not alone. I think that's really what's important about for this book for black people is like you are not alone, especially as a black Christian. You are not alone in your strive to be um, faithful to Christ, but also be have heaven now. <laughs> like you don't want to yeah. be oppressed your whole life. That's not wrong. Good for you. That's actually holy and righteous and like a good thing. Um, and then also, I think like reading the letter from Birmingham jail, like the white moderates are everywhere. Like they're everywhere. Oh. <laughs> Which maybe is like a mean thing to say, but they're everywhere. And I think it's like, read this book, please. Re please read this book. And this person who you post quotes about every year, like MLK Day, like, you know, we need to not be nonviolence. We need to be like this. I actually think you'd be real offended when you read his book. <laughs> and, uh, like, oh, actually, he would be unhappy with me. He would think that I was like complacent and I was a moderate and I was more looking for peace, quote unquote, and unity at the expense of people's lives, at the expense of people mm. um, living full, vibrant, thriving lives. Black people, people of color. Um, 
Yeah, so this, I mean, this is a real favorite of mine <laughs> that I could look and I'm going to read every year until it's no longer relevant, until it's like, oh, wow, five years ago, this book stopped being relevant at all to what's going on in the world. But when we can still replace 1963 with recent dates, summer of 2020, I mean, this book is something we all need to be thinking about and reflecting on and asking ourselves, what part do I play? Do I, am I the people, am I the Bull Connors of the world? Am I the pastors writing the letter to a person who's in solitary confinement for marching in the street? Or am I the person in solitary confinement? Like what role am I playing in this fight for just to be able to sit at a lunch counter? Yeah. Um, right. For, as a, I think the relevance for you, it's affirming, and and for people like me, it's extremely convicting how relevant it is because it's I'm I'm on the complete like the letter to letter from a Birmingham jail is written to me and my and my church and my community, and the relevance is is convicting that the separating things like the the body and the soul we oh we should just care about souls right is is called out yeah. by Dr King. 60 years ago and it's the same stuff those uh you know he says pious irrelevancies and sanctimonious trivialities the 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 good feeling things that that get said in a church but that are really just supporting the the status quo the something that stuck out to me is that this was not the history i was taught mm-hmm. like that i this was surprising to me and and yeah dr king here. is someone who you know, we it, we celebrated Martin Luther King Day at school, right? And we, I'm sure we we learned something, but it wasn't it wasn't this history. It was a very a very whitewashed, cleaned up version of this history where we've got it all figured out now, thanks to this person we're lifting up. But that I, I'm not so sure my community would have lifted up if it if it was happening today, right? Whoever Dr. King is today, I'm not sure my community is very happy with those people. So that it, it was extremely convicting and I think should be required reading for definitely all Christians, probably all elementary school students, mm-hmm. and then college students and high school students. And <laughs> Yeah, and I may, I may join you in the reading it every, every year thing uh, because, look, like I've, I mentioned before, you know, growing up, in, growing up in Fort Collins, it's like the whitest city in, in, in the nation. <laughs> and uh, I just was never exposed to, in the gut, never really knew anybody who was not white. And But my wife grew up in kind of near the inner city of Oklahoma City. And so she, first crush she ever had was a, a black kid in her classroom, you know. So she, she's like, she's very much, uh, very different history like personal histories and the thing that hit me so hard about this book was how it's kind of like Nathan kind of touched on it but when we when we hear Martin Luther King and MLK Jr. Day and all that kind of stuff we tend to think as as the white moderate in America we tend to think it's history right that was back in the 60s that happened way back then and you know, thank God that America is not racist anymore because we hired, you know, we, we uh, elected a Barack Obama. <laughs> and that's that's an interesting inf- information to have. <laughs> but how, like, like you said, it's, you could replace, put 2020 in there and it's the same. And how, how, much, how much of the information I just didn't know mm-hmm. about, about how, how they had to struggle and why they had to struggle. And honestly, the... Growing up, it's it's. I always got this idea that um, the black community at the time was just kind of like scraping things together and like, let's try this and let's try that. But there was so much organization and thought and strategy and planning. And I mean, <laughs> these were not folks who uh, didn't know what they were doing. This was a very, it was a very organized and very calculated process. And uh, it's just, I just was so just knocked over the head by this book. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I, I read it and I listened to it both. 
And the the audio, the the reader is fantastic, by the way. If you if you ever want to download the audio, but um, and I I just couldn't get enough of it. I think I read it in like two days. I just just blew through it because I had a lot of the same feelings that I think a lot of, well, I hope a lot of <laughs> white Christians had over the summer when with all these all these protests and things erupting over the across the country. Part of part of me at the time was like, "Oh, this is still a thing," mm-hmm. <laughs> and then I started realizing how much of a thing it still is, and and how I, I I realized I just really didn't understand how different life was in America for someone who's not white. And that may sound like the most obvious statement in the world, <laughs> but people tend to assume that everybody thinks like they think whoever it is um but the this this whole, the whole idea of justice just became such an important part of my my journey my faith journey and this this book by Martin Luther King uh Jr just really hit it hit all the notes i guess as i'm trying to say mm-hmm. i don't know if that makes any sense i'm just kind of it's like word i feel like it's like words so there's just so much going on in my head about this book right now. <laughs> well it's you know, it's it's from 1964, but it it is written directly to America of 2020 and 2021. I, th- I think that's why it's. Mm-hmm. I had only heard speeches by Dr. King, and the book is as dripping, densely heavy. Like there is not a wasted word. It, it you could probably mm-hmm. read this entire book as a speech. Um, I could write. <laughs> it's and it's it's. It's not only just full of information, but every sentence is powerful. So that mm-hmm. I, it was just like getting hit in the face over and over and over, right? For for the whole book with his amazing analogies of the you know the dagger being this close to the artery of the of American mm-hmm. freedom, and it's amazing that it didn't spurt into bloodshed, and instead it turned into this nonviolent movement. Um, so that I think that's one of the struggle is like where do you even start with a book that you just have to read every single word um, mm-hmm. <laughs> um and when that when it's not just like this book is great but like we need this book now and then all of the emotions that that brings up uh, you know it it's where, where was this book it's it was not in my community i was just knocked over the face i book i dog-eared it by the the very almost the very middle when when Dr. King outlines what the nonviolent strategy was, mm-hmm. um, and then there's these ten commandments for nonviolent action, and this is not this is not what I was taught, and it uh, I, I think my somehow my perception of of what happened in Bir- Birmingham, what happened in the civil rights movement, was more like what people watched on television. Right, the, the dramatic stuff that made it to the news. I've I've seen mm-hmm. dogs and hoses, and then people, and then a sit-in and and the word civil disobedience. None of that really clicked for me. But then I I read these uh, Ten Commandments uh, of of the nonviolent movement, and like I I'm just going to read it because I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe that I as a a devout Christian never, never made this connection, how spiritually grounded this movement was and is and should be. So I'm just going to read it because it, because it's amazing. So every volunteer, every volunteer got this training and was required to sign a commitment card. So the first part I hereby pledge myself, my person and body to the nonviolent movement. Therefore I will keep the following 10 commandments and they're mind blowing. Number one, meditate daily on the teachings and life of Jesus. Wh- what? <laughs> you know, <laughs> like uh, they were Christians. What in the world? They, right. They were Christians, and they centered the entire thing on, "Hey, let's let's keep the number one thing number one. Let's focus. Meditate daily on the teachings. You have to read your Bible every day, and sign that you're going to do that to be part of this movement. Um, number yeah, two. And, and, Sorry, yeah, I go ahead. Interrupt you for a second. That 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 hit, that hit me as well. 
as far as like like Nicole said, you're like, well, they're they're Christians, what? Mm -hmm. uh, because in school, all you're taught really is these people wanted equal rights for voting in school and etc. But it, it it surprised me how centered on faith it was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and may, maybe that's maybe that's the problem. Maybe this didn't get translated to me because I learned all this stuff in school and we never talked about it in church. Because if we had talked about this in church, we would have started with with this, right? But it but my church was still in the souls not bodies, you know, um what we need is just for each individual to accept Jesus and that's going to so solve the problems, but that is not what Dr. King believes in this book. Mm -hmm. Nicole, I'm curious, was it any different in growing up in a, in a black church as far as like the, the, the emphasis on things like that? We never really talked about it either, but it was just not, we were so in, I, when I was growing up, I mean, police shootings were not really a thing like it is now. Um, it was, but not really. So we weren't even talking about that. And then I think I was so isolated in my homeschool bubble <laughs> and in mm. my church bubble that my life was perfect. Like my childhood was real perfect. I just had all these friends and was around all these different kinds of people, mostly black people, grew up super affirmed. And we never even talked about, I'm sure Martin Luther King Jr. came up in a sermon. And I remember when Obama ran for president, it was like, listen, I don't care what you think, we have to vote for this man. <laughs> like I remember yeah. our pastor saying, we need to vote him into office. And we were all like, okay, cool. I wasn't old enough to vote. <laughs> but, um, yeah, we weren't really talking about it, but it's like we didn't really have to, you know what I mean? Because we were created, a community was created where we were all safe. Whereas now I think you have to talk about it. Even though the world has not gotten worse, it's just you have to be talking about this at church, even if it's a black church, because of what could happen when you leave your church building, right? Yeah, that, man, that, I feel like we we weren't we weren't talking about it either pro for for different reasons possibly but the the problem that the things that that happened in 2020 were not in my opinion a new thing it it was just the mm -hmm. same thing mm -hmm. that had been going on while your church wasn't talking about it and our church wasn't talking about it and my school wasn't talking about it I remember maybe in high school or in college that there were race riots. That's all I remember though. I just remember something like this happened. It was on the news. My opinion about it probably wasn't very strong, but it, it did not impact me. You know, just like a, I'm kind of numb to lots of, you know, news stories. And I don't know what, I don't, and I don't know what, what your story is like, but I'm a little bit embarrassed that it took until 2020 for me to even open my eyes to, to what was happening. Yeah. I think there's a lot of Americans and a lot of Christians who it, it was 2020 for them that they started to say there is a problem, but I'm a little ashamed that I, I saw the same thing and, and ignored it. And I wouldn't have said there's a problem, you know, before. I think I just didn't, I didn't even think about being black, right? My life was so set up in a way that my blackness was so affirmed and safe and protected that I never had to think about I'm black. And then I go to college and I hear like, you're smart for a black girl or like, you're pretty oh. for a black girl or like, you're, you have really good grades for someone from your town. And then I started to think like, I never heard this kind of stuff before. Like, what does this mean? You know, and then I just moved to Denver <laughs> mm. and, you know, have to seek out black friends, right? Seek, look for black people to meet, meet black friends, be in black community. I never really found it, um, which is why I don't live there anymore. Um, and, you know, build this church, help plant this church from zero to being a church building and have to deal with racism in the church from people on the serving staff and it's not talked about, right? It's brought up and then I'm told to not be political, right? So I didn't definitely didn't wake up in 2020. I probably woke up, started to wake up in like 2009 <laughs> because okay. it was like the first time I was in an atmosphere where 
I was one of a few compared to my childhood when I was just one of everybody. And I think yeah. that's something that like white people have to be really mindful of. Like those things that you say that you think are funny, like a little joke is supposed to be harmful. Like even if the one person who's there laughs, like it impacts us, right? It's like even in church when you say like, oh, well, I'm just going to preach on these riots real quick, but you don't preach about the thing that led to the protests and this very small group of people are causing riots, but you don't talk about the oppression that led to the outcry that turned into a protest that for some people turned into the language of a riot. That is like those little things that's like, okay, I'm not safe even in this church building. I'm not safe even around these Christians who are supposed to be the most loving people I know. Um, so I think that like for, you know, black people who are deconstructing, I think they're not only deconstructing things they were taught about just faith and those things that we're all kind of trying to figure out, but they're also trying to rid themselves of like language that was used to oppress them through the Bible, like language that people preached to keep people calm and to keep people in their place, quote unquote and to keep mm. people from fighting for freedom or fighting for their rights because it's like that's not really the christian thing to do that's not really what we do here we talk about like you were saying the soul not the body and i'm kind of losing what i'm even talking about right now but um i think that for me like once i started to really put it all together and i was realizing that like people who i was following in church, like pastors who I had helped build this church, who I was serving hours in their congregation every week, wouldn't say Black Lives Matter from the pulpit because it was too political, but could talk about Black people having abortions and could preach about how Black people need to not have abortions, but couldn't talk about police shooting Black people in the street. It was like my, it was like the, the just this, awakening of a different level it was like the spiritual awakening of like the lights going off like jesus like get out of there <laughs> save yourself get out um and i think that wow. that's like something that black christians are just trying to be like i'm not going to be in this church anymore where you preach the good stuff as long as it's about jesus but when it comes to me saying hey at you know the police in our neighborhood are abusing my son and you ask the question, well, what's your son doing? Before you ask, why are they abusing him? You know what I mean? It's like, I feel like this book is, is like helping black people who are Christians to get free of the crap that the church tries to, the big C church tries to put on us to keep us oppressed. And then also find like affirming faith spaces where you can actually serve a God who is passionate about justice and freedom and wants you to have that now. And it's not God that created these systems that we're using. We were given free reign to build this world and we built a world where people are dying every day and there are billionaires and people in poverty and people who are oppressed because of the color of their skin. What in the world are we doing? <laughs> that was not God's intention. <laughs> Yeah, it makes me think this this quote that I, I copied down from the book. He said, So often the contemporary church is a weak, ineffectual voice with an uncertain sound. So often it is an arch defender of the status quo. Far from being disturbed by the presence of the church, the power structure of the average community is, consider, is consoled by the church's silence and even vocal sanction of things as they are. And then this, this, is, this really hit me. But the judgment of God is upon the church as never before. Mm -hmm. If today's church does not recapture the sacrificial spirit of the early church, it will lose its authenticity, forfeit the loyalty of millions, and be dismissed as an irrelevant social club mm -hmm. with no meaning for the 20th century. Every day I meet young people whose disappointment with the church has turned into outright disgust. And I, that, that breaks my heart because th <laughs> you could write that now. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's it's the, the things going on then with lack of care for justice for humans mm -hmm. were it was ignored by the church for the status quo. And that's one that's one big thing that kind of kicked me into high gear with the deconstruction thing as as we've talked about. As I was kind of it's like a trickle deconstruction for a while, but this this hit and it's like full speed ahead. 
mm-hmm. because the church that I was a part of just they weren't like uh, they weren't like it's not a racist church by any stretch, but they were like, you know, let's not talk about that stuff. You know, it's like like you said, too political. And when it it broke my heart that the things that when we're just talking about basic justice and basic uh, loving your human your fellow human. And that becomes political. Mm-hmm. It makes it makes me really question what what the whole church is about. Mm-hmm. And the this in, this entire book, I think a lot of it is very much written. I think with church leaders in mind. It, mm-hmm. I mean the the Birmingham the letter from Birmingham jail is literally written to church leaders, mm-hmm. but but much of the rest of the book there are there are Easter eggs in there that. That are that is Dr. King trying to talk to the white church and trying to say over and over again that when you're silent, you're taking a side. Mm-hmm. When you Yeah. When you are one of the things every once in a while there was a quote that was about the government and I scratched it out and put church in it. So <laughs> I'm changing the words, but one was like, There is a right and a wrong side to this conflict, and the church doesn't belong in the middle. Mm-hmm. He says we the church sees injustice not as evil to be corrected, but an institution to be defended, mm-hmm. or, or or just you know just as blistering. Sure, it's it's bad that there are you know he calls them like brutes, the people who are actually perpetrating the violence with the baton, that's evil. But in Doctor King's mind, that wasn't the big evil. The big evil was the society watching that. Yeah. And not doing anything about it or mm-hmm. tacitly supporting it. And it, sure, we can point to those those evil people. They should Well, sure, they shouldn't do that. But we are supporting the structure that allows them to, to do that and, and get away with it. Mm-hmm. And, the, and there's so many, you know, preachers, pastors are getting up in front of a, front of a congregation that their paycheck depends on. And so they don't want to say something that's that's going to get someone to stand up and walk out. And so that's that's what they're choosing. That's also called out in this book. The, the companies chose the dollars over the people. We had a system that chose dollars over dignity for 400 years. And then and then now pastors are afraid to take sides. So they just say things that sound godly but that that are <laughs> calls to you know it's oatmeal it's not you know it's not milk or meat it's just kind of in the middle to not offend you it's baby food um but it but that's taking aside mm-hmm. that the church is one of the power structures and the i think we use this quote by martin luther king this is one i know because it's good it's like oh the it's something like the the arc of the I'm going to get it wrong. The arc of the universe is long and it bends towards justice. I don't even know if I think it's maybe falsely attributed to Dr. King, but um, (laughs) it's this, it's this idea that you can be on the right or or the wrong side of history. Cause do you know what history is going? It's, it's bending towards justice. But in this book, that's not, he's saying not unless you bend it towards justice. It doesn't bend towards justice. It you're you have to do it. You you can't wait for it. You have to to bring about that justice. And and so if there's injustice and the church isn't doing anything, it's it's supporting that just that injustice. It's perpetuating it. Yeah. Yeah, we I mean we have to meet people's needs. People's right now in the moment in their lives outside of just their salvation their physical needs and when people are saying i can't exist doing the most normal things going for a run because like amon arbery i could get tracked down by white vigilantes and get murdered going to sleep like brianna taylor i could get shot in my bed like drop getting pulled over and following all the rules but saying I have a license to carry and getting shot on right away with a three-year-old in the back seat like Philando Castile. It's like I can't do the normal things without thinking about, okay, I'm driving 
three hours. I'm going to go ahead and put my license and registration in the like in the front of me on the wheel so I don't have to reach anywhere in case I get pulled over. I will make sure like I just, you know, am my best self. If I am going somewhere where there's mostly only white people, I'm not going to go without my spouse who's white because I don't know if people are going to be racist or be violent or be feel some kind of way, right? And it's like, it sounds silly, but those are things that we think about. Black people are just thinking about like, okay, where am I going? How far do I have to drive? Is it going to be dark? Are there, what's the police like in that town? Who's who's the mayor? Who's the governor? <laughs> like, what's, what's the vibe? This church, what's on their website? You know, when people invite me to church, I'm like, okay, yeah, okay, you want me to come to your church? Well, let me just peruse the website here. Let me just see. What are you preaching about? What are you talking about? What's on your pastor's Instagram page? What's on this? Because there's no way now am I walking into a church and I just am not doing that to myself anymore. I'm not walking into a church and having someone look me in the face and say like, oh yes, I know that you're going through this, but let's talk about your soul, right? Let's talk about salvation. No, talk about meeting my basic needs right now, right? And so I think that when we as a church, and especially, you know, I don't want to be this person talking to white people, but when you read this stuff and you fall into guilt and shame and you let yourself feel condemned, not convicted, conviction is good. Conviction moves you to action. Condemnation halts you, right? Shame halts you. Guilt can halt you. You have to not look at this as a personal, kind of like I am a bad person, I am white, so I do this. But you have to understand, like, you benefit from a system that people created. And you have the power, even in your small circles, to dismantle it to some degree. And that, when you don't take the initiative to learn and to start to dismantle, then that's kind of when it starts to be, like, not your fault, but it's like you are mindfully benefiting from something that other people are dying like dying from them. Yeah, dying from. It's killing people. And you are living this like blissful life. What are you doing? You're just watching TV and like going to church? Come on now. <laughs> people are dying, like literally dying. So it's like, how can you say that you are following Christ? And I don't want to, I don't want to question people Christ, Christianity. I don't like doing that. I'm not trying to do that here, but it's more like Jesus would do it. Jesus would do it. Jesus would do it. <laughs> like, there's no question in my mind. When people, it's like manipulate, gaslighting you, right? Trying to be like, well, Jesus would do this. No, actually, if I step away from what you're saying, the crap you're trying to feed me, and I actually like dive into the Bible, Jesus would be standing with Martin Luther King Jr. Jesus would have been in solitary confinement. Jesus would not have been writing a letter saying like, can't you wait? Why are you so eager? Can't you wait? Do your kids really have to go to school with white kids? Can't they wait? Can't they go to their, you know, their black school with their old books and their no desks? Do you have to go to school with these white kids? So I don't know. I get really fired up about this stuff because I feel like we as Christians miss this opportunity to speak life into death, to speak love into a, an opportunity where there could be a lot of hate. And we try and just brush past the work and get to forgiveness and forgiveness and you know unity but we don't do the work that leads to true reconciliation and as long as white supremacy is in permeating every aspect of our society we can't be this like unity filled place because this large part of society is dying still oh <laughs> Dr. King talks about this false peace, which is what so many Christians default to and so many churches default yeah. to. It's the, um, I have it written down here somewhere, but, but we think we're pursuing peace, but it's really silence. Mm -hmm. It's, it's the absence of complaint. It's not peace though. And it, the pastors and, and churches are afraid that they're going to say something political and someone's going to walk out. Jesus had to walk out of his own sermons. Like it's it's not that people left; it's that he had to run away. So he wasn't he wasn't afraid of saying the right thing, even if it it was going to make someone uncomfortable. He wasn't there to make people uncomfortable, but the truth is uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. You know the the 
truth will hit you in the face, and he wasn't afraid to he wasn't afraid to stand up, especially to the specifically the religious people who had power and were and were perpetrating injustice. And the the milk toast watered down sermons that that we're comfortable talking about the first century, as long as we don't bring it to what does that mean today? I think that's mostly fear. It's it's yes. fear of making people angry. There's no value in making people angry. That's not an inherently good thing. But Jesus made you know Jesus was crucified because he made the because he refused to to let that power structure stay unchallenged. And it, and he wasn't there to challenge it. it. It was just that the truth and love challenges that. So if you're if if there's truth in love, it's it's going to run up against those those flaws and the. I think one thing that is uncomfortable about reading this book is that in 1963, Dr. King was asking Americans to look seriously at our country, and he was saying there's some flaws here, and he he based a lot of the rhetoric on the promise, all oh, that the amazing promise of the ideals of this country. Those are great things. Now let's see how we how we're doing, right? If that's a hundred, what are we scoring compared to reality? And and he brings it to our founding documents and how what a sin it was that our the the thing that we hold up, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, that we took out the parts forbidding slavery. Right? So so if we're gonna hold up the Constitution as this amazing thing, we should also look at the the history that the the people that, that we that we held down with it. And the, so the, so the uncomfortable thing about looking at your country and seeing fault in it, that that's a thing that if you haven't practiced that muscle, it feels really scary. And, and it's the same thing with the church. The, the church has faults because it's made, it's made up of a bunch of people with faults. And, and I think that there's a, a scary thing when you start to look at it and it just say the faults out loud, Hey, th- this is a problem with the church. That That's a scary thing. If, if you grew up um, thinking the church was kind of the answer and the world's got it wrong and, and they need to get in here so that, so that they've got it right. But Dr. King is calling us to look at our faults and then address them and take that next step. It's look at, look at our faults, look at Jesus, see the discrepancy we could stop and feel condemned and ashamed or we we can take action and i think that's what's that's something that's been sad because i think i expected the church to do better i mean the, but the church is me you know so the church didn't do better but i didn't either it took me 30 years of my life to even care about the suffering that i saw on the news every 3 or 4 years so it's a, it's a wake up call and it's, it's hard, it's hard where to go next. But I think that for me, what I've started is I've got to be comfortable with criticizing my country and my church. That's, that's got to be part of it and myself mm-hmm. um, so, so that we can make it better, uh, holding it up to that ideal, not in the middle of a, in the, the letter um, from a Birmingham jail. I always thought it was prison. That's why I keep saying it weird. Um, uh, Dr. King talks about uh, something you said it, it, at the very beginning uh, w- when you started talking that you love the church. Like the, you are not, you're not here to church bash or to mm-hmm. Jesus, Christian mm-hmm. bash or whatever. And he, he says there can be no deep disappointment where there is not deep love. Mm-hmm. Yes, I love the church. How could I do otherwise? And he's, he's the son, grandson, great grandson of preachers. Yes, I see the church as the body of Christ, but oh, how we have blemished and scarred that body through social neglect and through fear of being nonconformists. It's a, it's the entire motivation of the nonviolent movement was love, and the the motivation of this letter to to the white moderate Christian is is not to it. It is completely love. It is that that motivation that is disappointment that comes because of deep love, not because of 
you know, some kind of antagonism between groups. And he and he he speaks. I mean, every every page speaks to to twenty twenty one, which is both you know affirming and disappointing. Mm-hmm. Um, but but what I've heard maybe on social media and also in sermons are are things like, well, you know, BLM is communist. They're socialists. They <laughs> whatever. And doc, I know what Doctor King answer to that is. It's like okay, then church, step up. Mm-hmm. If you don't want uh, you know communists leading the movement then how about you let some G- some christians lead the movement then do it do something about it right and he also would have said there you know you don't know what you're talking what a communist or a socialist <laughs> is but but the the main point there is you know because dr king's got quite a lot of economic policy in here that we could l- easily label him a socialist and a communist as well mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. what he cared about was power and injustice and the mm-hmm. oppressed mm-hmm. but but his answer wouldn't be Okay, yeah, you, you've got a point there. They've got a failing, so we shouldn't support the movement. His point is the church should be at the forefront of the movement. Why? Because we know Christ and 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 truth. And so, how can we do anything other than that? But I've done something other than that my whole life. I've done nothing. I mean, it's a key opportunity, right? It's like we we are supposed to be embodying this thing that is permeates love and grace and what a better way to bring about change in the world if not through love and grace but when we completely remove ourselves from the conversation because it's not about salvation we leave people we leave other people to do the work and then we complain about the way they do it (laughs) it's like you you know there's this this person who says if you're going to criticize the way that i respond to oppression i hope to see a record of you speaking just as strongly about the oppression right like if you're going to have a response about the way i react to it i hope you're talking about what i'm reacting to as well and it's like christians we have to we really have to step up that's really all it is we have to step up and stop hiding stop surrounding ourselves with just christians who all look like us and who all you know have our same experiences and blasey blasey and like get out into the world and start meeting people's needs because the world is full of people who are in pain and while we're happy singing our songs and you know listen to our sermons there are people who are dying and people who are grieving and people who are looking for hope and love and grace Really, that's what everyone's looking for. They're looking for a space to just be their true selves and to thrive in love. And if we have it, why are we not using it to drive this movement? Why aren't we doing it? It's because we're afraid and because we think we don't have to, but we do. Yeah, and I mean, we all need that space of safety. It's it's like the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? The the the, the basic needs just like basic safety is necessary before you get any higher up. Like you're talking about saving your soul. Fine. But I'm hungry and I'm getting killed in the streets. One thing I'd like to see from the white Christian um, community is to push back when people are trying to do the thing that they often do, which is if, if it says someone says racism is a problem, then the response is often like, Oh, but there's lots of problems, you know, it's like, it's the and it's like well that doesn't mean racism is not a problem, <laughs> and we need to to not that 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 tactic is used often to like minimize things and to dismiss it and to move it aside. Say so let's let's talk about the real problems in this in this world and like abortion or whatever you want to to say, and we need to. I mean, there's a lot of things we need to do, and it's one of the questions I want to ask you in a minute is what can we do. Um, but one of the things I think a good place to start is just realize that this, the stuff that's written in this book is there for a reason and it's not, it's not new. It's not old. It's, it's just, it's always been there and pretending like everything's fine is not helping anybody. It's just, it's just not. It's the good Samaritan all over again. You know, if, if the good, if we were reading the news story about the good Samaritan, we would have been like, yeah, these Samaritans are radicals. They've got it all wrong. 
they need a <laughs> they need to stop annoying us because we're uh the good samaritan is a story about first of all the the number one thing jesus has asked us to do that's that's when he tells the story of the good samaritan love god and love your neighbor well who's my neighbor blm is your neighbor now do what they're doing don't walk by the guy who's on the side of the road and is hurting because you have a religious reason to not do that the entire story is is about what's happening in 2021 it's you can be pious and walk along that road and you have missed the point you can be communist or whatever samaritan and help the person and you have you have followed what i'm asking you to do mm-hmm. but we would rather criticize what samaritans have wrong with them than acknowledge that there's even someone on the side of the road mm-hmm. and it's it's more comfortable to debate the the laws that the pharisees were debating we're, we're doing the same things what let's dive into the text and let's get it more right than we had it before and and let's 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 keep our mind on things above not on that guy on the side of the road below but that's that's not that's not what what jesus calls us to do which is the why the the 10 commandments of nonviolence was so compelling to me because uh, it could just be the Ten Commandments of Christian living. That it, it, that's not what it's meant to be, but it's it's a call to radical love. It's a call to join an army whose only weapon is love, and mm. it, and that's like that's what the church is supposed to be. Mm-hmm. Um, but so why is the church so often like the structure that is fighting this is 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 keeping the the status quo? I love the first section. Uh, Dr. King talks about this idea that there have been many revolutions and the tool of the revolution arises when it's needed. The, uh, he talks about the French revolution, the, the, the American revolution, the, you know, whatever it is that, that meets the, like the moment that tool is going to arise. And that's when he launches into this, this idea of, of nonviolence and, and why it was so powerful and why it was the perfect tool for the moment. And in 1963, there were written explicit laws that people supported, right? The, I don't know, George Wallace, segregation now, segregation forever. <laughs> he said that as his campaign strategy. He was saying it out loud. And it, and, it was all, and it was written into the laws so that moderate people like me could say, well, it's just the law, right? I'm just following mm-hmm. the law. And like he's, you know, his criticism is, and it was it was um, followed equally in in pews as it was in theaters, right? The, the mm-hmm. Christians just went along with it. It seems like there are laws that have there are historical laws, maybe that that have caused problems, redlining, credit scores, th- things that 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 are still causing oppression. But I think there are now a lot of unwritten social structures. They're not explicit. People aren't going to come up and say, I'm, I'm a racist. Nobody believes they're a racist, right? A very few, there are crazy people who enjoy that they're racist, but the rest of people, they're not going to say I'm a racist, right? Um, I don't, I'm, I'm against that stuff. They're not going to say it out loud, but there are these implicit laws and rules and structures. And so I wonder if, if nonviolence and civil disobedience was the tool for the 1963 revolution. Is that the tool for the 2021 revolution? You know, mm-hmm. and if if not, what is the what is the tool that's going to arise for this revolution where we're we're not trying to knock over explicit laws, we're trying to to undermine social structures and and these <laughs> unspoken whispering things, you know? It's a good question. <laughs> you don't know the answer come on great question um no i think it's what's the really, solution yeah forever yeah what's the what is the language of today and you know it's hard because i think about protests and even now you know in 2020 there were new factors entered into the protests fear that made them more dangerous. So counter protests, right? Like rubber bullets, pepper mm-hmm. spraying, all these things. And of course, before they had dogs and hoses, but like 
a hose and a rubber bullet. They're, they're a little different the way they, they affect the body. So I think like for me, I never protested. I didn't attend a single protest um, because of COVID and also like anxiety and just feeling like unsafe. It didn't make me feel safe to be going to protests, knowing there'd be counter protests either in Philly or in Washington, DC. And so I think that that's a good question. Like what is the language that is gonna be most effective? I don't know. Is it going to be this nonviolent? Nonviolence is, I think, always the right thing to do. Um, but is that what's going to work now? Or is it going to be more like, I don't know what they're doing in Georgia, like the Stacey Abrams rallying people, getting people voting, getting people registered, getting people to understand their power and the way that their, their voice impacts local politics. Is that going to be what we need to be doing? We need to be getting people more involved. I don't know. I really don't know, but I think regardless of what it is, the church needs to be involved, heavily involved. Um, and if you're not ready to get involved, then you need, I don't know, just get out of the way. Really, that's kind of like my thing. <laughs> we don't want to get involved, just get out of the way. Because really what people are doing is they don't realize they're impeding justice. You are standing in the way. Sure, you're not overtly racist, but you are allowing racist systems to persist because of your body being in the way. So just please move. Please mm. move. <laughs> <laughs> just please move. Yeah, and the you know, there's the we'll move we'll move our support immediately and quickly and reflexively behind order. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we gotta bless those troops keeping us safe for those, you know, th- thanks to those officers holding it together, which is Dr. King writes about that. That was happening then. It was the same conversation that the Christians were more devoted to that negative peace than to justice and to mm-hmm. and and to this order that that makes sense because my my interactions with police uh are very different. I ha- I don't have fear. I have power. Right? Mm-hmm. Um and I and so I can't imagine what it what it feels like for for the for people I know I remember in the south side of Oklahoma City same same place as uh, Steve's wife where the kids were all scared of police you know and I I came in as the you know white evangelical from Fort Collins I was like no police are our friends and they're like you you know you, not our friends right so I I do think there's a tool I'm sure I'm not the only person who said this but phones I think one reason why I woke up in 2020 is because of cell phones yeah. with video cameras and cell reception because mm-hmm. the because I didn't believe people they were telling their stories I had to see it um, mm-hmm. first person so that's that's a definite tool but, but I wonder for the the people like me who who sit in a pew and I know the tension that's going on I know when a preacher gets up and says something I know what he's not saying on purpose and why he's not saying that thing because of who's going to get offended and why. And I wonder if for, for black people in the sixties, they had, they, they had this nonviolent civil disobedience. And I wonder if white people in the, in the twenties need social disobedience. It's, it's not about the, the laws because of government of Fort Collins is way, way ahead of us. The, corporations are even doing better than us as the church it's the it's now the church who's lagging behind yeah and and the it's because we're not willing to to be offended every once in a while into into noticing something or into addressing something that we'd rather sweep under the rug and i think jesus was all about that but a a church can be a static power structure just like anything else that eventually gets more it's more interested in continuing itself than serving others which is the why churches should exist the, the whole point point. and jesus I think another is also sorry nathan to cut you off but is education like you have to know history and you have to understand how systems like how a law that was created 50 years ago and was then dismantled maybe 25 years later still has is still impacting people, yeah. right? Because of the way that it didn't allow people to own a house, right? Just as simple as that. You could, your grandparents couldn't own a house. So 
Now people whose grandparents did own houses have generational wealth. People whose grandparents didn't, and then their parents now own houses but have debt because they didn't inherit anything from their grandparents. Like you have to understand how laws are created, how they impact people in the now, and then how they impact people in the future, and how something that was dismantled 30 years ago, their people are still feeling that now, and there are people who are way further along because they weren't impacted by that law. So I think if you don't understand Jim Crow, if you don't understand, um, like Nathan, like you were saying, redlining, if you don't understand the Homestead Act and who was not able to fully benefit from the Homestead Act and what the Homestead Act allowed people to do, if you don't understand um, the Oklahoma, the Wall Street, right? Tulsa Wall Street, Black Wall Street, and what happened there. If you don't understand the bombing in Philadelphia when, when America bombed its own citizens in Philly, MOVE, the MOVE group, you, when, if you don't understand these things, then, like Steve, you were saying before, it's just like, oh, people just want rights? Okay. But <laughs> it's this thing that has been persisting to where what you have and what your grandparents have and what you being able to go to college and your grandparents paid for you to go, you have something other people never even got the chance to get. And so if you don't understand that, you don't see why it's a big deal, right? Why, why is it a big deal that my pastor's not preaching about this? Why is it a big deal that we're not protesting? It's a big deal because these people do not get to live the life that you get to live because they're, their relatives and ancestors never got to have that. So they're starting in a different place. So I think it's like a tool is just your phones recording things that are bad, but also like you have to take the initiative to learn. Do your research about groups that you don't belong to. <laughs> like read about things that were done to people and how long it was done for. And then when that was gone away, this idea that, oh, no one's, there's, there's not slaves anymore, but y'all are still below us. <laughs> like you're not yeah. gonna walk on the same sidewalk as me and we can arrest you for standing on the sidewalk and you can go to jail for the rest of your life right we abolished slavery but the 13th amendment made slavery legal as a response to payment for a crime right like there are still enslaved people we have so many people yeah. in prison we are still anyway i could be on this hill for the rest of my life but you have to do we have to do our research and we have to be reading books like this and then reading history books the color of law Black Bodies and the Justice of God by Kelly Brown Douglas, James Baldwin. You gotta figure out Malcolm X. We've been told he was bad. Today's his birthday. He's not bad. Read Malcolm X. Listen to Malcolm X. Like we have to just educate ourselves and just entertain the thought that maybe everything I was told is kind of wrong or like <laughs> a quarter of the truth. <laughs> and I need to now learn the whole truth. Yeah, like yeah. If nothing else, if maybe. Just pretend that everything I had told was not wrong, but mm -hmm. there's just a lot that I haven't been told. Mm -hmm. Like, and we like to think. I think the 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 average white American likes to think that this is not our problem. Mm -hmm. Like the slavery that was so long ago. Yeah. And um, like my wife grew up in Oklahoma, never heard about the Tulsa, uh, the Black Wall Street, the Tulsa, and the the riots that went on there and the destruction. Mm -hmm. She didn't hear about that until like this past year or so. Mm -hmm. And we've been trying to, in white Fort Collins, we've been trying to expose ourselves more to, to the history and to just even television shows with more black people on them, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. uh, little things like that. And, and I think I'm glad that there's been more stuff, more, more popular stuff lately anyway. Uh, like uh, Lovecraft Country on HBO was fantastic because it, it actually centered around that nineteen it was nineteen nineteen uh, Wall, Tulsa Wall Street thing. Uh, anyway, we we like to think it's not our problem, but it, I saw a tweet recently that Thomas Jefferson was alive when Harriet Tubman was born. Harriet Tubman was still alive when Ronald Reagan was born. It's not that long ago. <laughs> This the the that we had slavery in this country, and I loved what Dr. King says near the end of the book about like kind of reparations, essentially. And and I started thinking about this as well. In in the Old Testament, we see a lot of in instances where God mentions how the problem 
or the, the sin will be, I, I think I forget the terminology, visited upon the fourth generation of people. And I always kind of wondered what that meant. Like, That's how in the world can, can God punish somebody f- generations away from who, what the, somebody did? And that's that's kind of what we're dealing with here, is that we're still dealing with the sins of our great 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 grandfathers, and we need to do something about it instead of just like, well, it was, I didn't do it, I've never had a slave. <laughs> well, that's not the point. The point is that people who were enslaved, their their great grandparents didn't have the 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 things that you have, and that's a problem. So it all, it all comes back to justice. Yeah, that I think the that quote and and just the because the sixties feel as far away from me as the seventeen seventies, like that it's just <laughs> his it's just ancient history, you know. It's it's the back then, but but we're we're modern, so we don't have problems anymore. I think it, I think it's a very human thing to think like Nazism was ancient history. We're we evolved since what? I'm I'm bad at math. 60 years ago or whatever like no we're, we're the same people that we were in the 1700s and the mm-hmm. 1500s and the 1960s we are the same people with the same impulses and drives and fears and 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 everything we are just as capable i, I think that white christianity feels like they would not be capable of just what was commonplace in in the u.s 60 mm-hmm. years ago but we all think we'd be on the side of the civil rights movement. That's how I was taught about the civil rights movement in elementary school. I was like, that's the team I would be on. It's, it's, it's the same as I can't imagine myself ever being a Pharisee. I can just imagine myself being Jesus. Basically. <laughs> I'm like always Jesus in the story, but, I, but that's not, <laughs> I'm not ever Jesus. I'm always a Pharisee. And I, I would have been, I would have been, you know, preaching in the church and saying like, Listen, I I understand that they've got a problem, but this isn't the way to go about it. You know, I I would I would be that because I'm we're we're not we're not there. We haven't arrived, and we're we're probably never going to arrive, which means there's always work to do. I I've I've been I want to hear what what you have, you have to think about this. I have this idea in my mind, which is about because there there is like you said, Nicole there is now this endless information that I, I just can't believe when I see it. It's been there the whole time, but I wasn't asking the question. I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't the perfect word woke. I, it's this perfect word because it, you know, sometimes it is like, Oh, you open your eyes and now you can see, and now you want to dive into this stuff. But I, I wonder about the people who are very far away from woke because they're not going to, they're probably not going to open this this book, but they should. They're certainly not going to dive even deeper in, into the, the rabbit hole because they don't have a reason yet. They don't. They're not asking the question. And I, I've been wondering, like, I am, I am someone who who understands what it is to be there, to be that person, and so I feel like I'm a step closer to understanding the language that someone like that is going to be open to. Like, what are the things that, that are going to impact them? And I, I kind of wonder, as a semi-reformed, newly half-woke Christian moderate, you know, who are the people that I can reach who, like, if you say Black Lives Matter or if you're in BLM or something or or you want to talk about the nuances of Antifa, like, that, yeah, it's too late. You lost them, right? They're not, it's, they're not going to listen to that. But we need them to listen to somebody. I don't know what what that is, but I I do wonder if the if there there is language that can start helping those people ask the right questions, you know, without them having to. I you I'd want to say it's Christian leaders, you know, preachers pre, preach it because because you've got authority. I don't I don't have that. I'm sitting in the pew next to someone, but um, I think that. That's like a half step, easy step is to engage where I am is only half a step away from that. So, so I feel like it's like Paul being the apostle to the Gentiles. It's like, I'm, you know, who's going to be the apostle to the, to the backwoods. (laughs) Maybe we shouldn't call it that, but, (laughs) but how, 
how how do we get people who are like who are you know down with Trump to also be against systematic injustice, right? Um, I I personally think it's possible, but it's not going to be the history is going to go over their head. It's got to be something else. I don't know what it is, but I I have this strong desire, you know. Yeah, no, you have to create on ramps for them, and I think that's like the most valuable thing I've ever. One of the most valuable things I've learned in this work was from an activist named Deray McKesson, who's in Baltimore, and he said, in the work of social justice, you have to create on ramps for people because not everyone is going to be where you are. And if you're on the highway, you're just going, 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 and you just expect them to jump on board and just join the pace, like they're going to crash and burn. So you have to create an on-ramp for them for where they are to be able to join the flow of traffic, right? So thinking like, okay, like they're not going to talk to me. I'm not going to talk to those people. I'm sorry, I'm not at that place. So they're, I'm not talking to them. So like, you know, I think that's the work of being a... Uh, an ally. I don't like to say the word ally. I don't like that people like to call themselves ally. I think it's a weird type title to give yourself. Like, why do you need to have a title? But if you want to be an ally, it is you putting <laughs> yourself as a white person in the position to do that work. Like, okay, you know, my cousin is kind of like, you know, they're not a bad person, but they don't really see the value of that. I'm not going to bring them around my black friends and try and have my black friends tell them that. I'm going to be the person who's going to think like, what's a good entry place for them? Maybe an entry place is just thinking about like the rural white American and how they are disenfranchised by billionaires. And that is and like bringing them into the conversation of just injustice in general. Like that's not right, right? Like how does Amazon take advantage of these rural people, right? So like, I think you have to think about what is a way that I can just bring them into the conversation of injustice and then flow that into, so black people, <laughs> in a, a more, you know, like a more beautiful way, but you have to create on-ramps for people and we have to, we can't expect people, like you were saying, Nathan, like we're a step or a few away from being back there, right? Like we can't expect everyone to just be where we are, wake up one morning, know all that we know and jump into the fight where we are. I have to say, okay, this person is here. And if I believe that they have the potential to join this work, I have to meet them there and think about what is a good on-ramp for them to enter the conversation. Mm, that's really good. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. I think, and honestly, if you know, if you could change the cover, call it so something else, this is an on-ramp book. Why, why We Can't Wait right. takes takes these ideas of like America, this, uh, it's, it's taking the ideals that you believe, whether they're the Christian ideals or the, or the kind of what you're taught that America is founded on what we stand for. It's, it's taking you and as a, as a white person, white evangelical reading this book and just kind of letting you come along on the journey. Um, mm -hmm. so that at the end, when, when he says we need to do something about it and it's, by the way, we also need to adjust, address the last 400 years of this, you're like, yeah, I'm down for that. But if, if I'd read the last page, <laughs> the last page first, it's, you know, it doesn't have the same effect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's one reason I liked the book so much is that it, it didn't assume a, a lot of stuff about the reader, I guess. Yeah. You know, he, he, it's very approachable. It's like he, he, it's, I don't know how he does it, but he's somehow, he starts where where everybody is, <laughs> where we have the preacher, be. yeah, third generation. <laughs> like you said, uh, Nicole, it's very affirming as a black person reading it, and it's very informing for me. Mm -hmm. And um, and it, it did it really moved my heart a lot, you know, to to have some a lot more empathy than than I have had, and I hope that 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 continues. I'm going to try to get as many of my white friends to read this book as I can. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Um, for for so many reasons, and I because I think that, that that if we can get, I mean, I I I would like to think that Christians want to do the right thing. Yeah, <laughs> that's you yeah. know that's the theory. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I think that there's so much. As humans, we are so flawed, and like I said already, we assume everybody thinks like we do. We assume everyone's experiences were like ours. Mm -hmm. Um, like we assume that 
uh, that we, when we drive down the road, we're thinking the same thing that you're thinking as far as like when I pass the police and if we can work on getting some more empathy and getting people to understand what people that look different than me deal with and the fact, and just, just the basic fact that they do deal with things that are in, in, in different ways than I do. And it's not mm -hmm. their fault. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a good place to start. Anyway, I, we could probably talk about this forever, but we probably should wrap it up a little bit. But, so it, you have any th last thoughts for us, Nicole, about, you know, one, one thing that I always kind of wonder is, is like, what can we do? Like you said, on ramps, create on ramps mm -hmm. is great. Any other thoughts about the book or advice for us? Uh, almost middle-aged white dudes. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, I think just talking about this in general is a start. And I also think giving space, like Nathan inviting me to come and talk on the podcast and amplifying my voice and giving, a you know, room for a black woman to be able to talk to your audience, right? Like who people, I don't know if I ever would have been able to meet them or talk to them about injustice and the and Martin Luther King Jr. and just these little things they probably haven't thought about to how, like you were saying, Steve, like black people have different experiences here. Um, and I think it's just the work is just thinking about like, what can I do where I am with what I have? That's what I always encourage people to think about. What can I do where I am with what I have? And if all I can do is talk to my family about the ways we think about people who are different, the ways we treat people, how we can be more equitable, a more inclusive family, then that's what you can do where you are with what you have. If you could talk to your church about that and you hear it, right? If you hear someone say something and you say, well, what do you mean by that? Hey, I heard you say, you know, black people are lazy. What do you mean by that? Just, I'm just curious. Like, where, did that, where do you think that came from? What you know, what experiences have you had that have led you to think about that? I would love to just hear more about that. And unpacking those things with people, right? Because someone's not going to be like, oh, I don't know where I heard that from. I don't even know why I said that. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Or, or like, I heard it from this, right? So I, I encourage people to start to ask questions, to start to have conversations. And when you become someone who knows a lot, do not come at people really intense and push them away because no one wants to be like constantly challenged by their friend. Like you're a racist, you're a jerk, you're this, you're this. <laughs> like assume positive intent and in your circles, undo, like try to move people along so that when they're out in the world around black people and they have, they're in positions of power, they don't perpetuate injustice, right? So do what you can with what you have, where you are, start to ask questions, create on ramps for people and read, 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 and then use that knowledge to impact the way that you view the world. And also if I could say one more thing, like don't think that you're ever done learning, right? I'm, I am constantly addressing bias in myself, anti-black bias, bias against white men, you know, like, you know, like even I'm married to one, like thinking about how I feel about white people the more I learn about injustice, like, am I starting to not do this through a lens of Christ? And I'm actually allowing myself to feel some kind of way about people who are white, right? And addressing that, unpacking those feelings, people in leadership. So always also reflecting on yourself, like, okay, I'm learning, but am I also, am I just learning to teach or am I learning to actually be a better person and to love people better and to not perpetuate systems of oppression? So that was a lot. But no, that's fantastic. If you can get it all, rewind it, and then play it <laughs> slow motion. That, yeah. Man, that that is so so helpful. This I feel like it connects directly to you talked about your faith story and what what you learned by watching your parents change their beliefs, and that it's possible and that it's okay. Mm -hmm. um, and and I am someone who, when I change my beliefs, I go from thinking I was correct. To then changing my belief and thinking I'm correct and then better than the people who believed whatever I just believed just just then. And I I think that's that's such a good lesson from from your faith story and, and from what you just said that you know, you don't it's not a bludgeon that you use against people who 
aren't where you are, but also mm -hmm. you, you shouldn't stop and feel, you know, glorified in your, in your rightness, your correctness. It's, it's, you, you can keep going. You're like, yeah, you learned that you can be correct. Guess what else you're probably wrong about? You know, you can mm -hmm. be wrong. So, so keep going. I think, yeah. Th thank you so much for, for joining us. It's been an honor The yeah, I am going to recommend this book to everyone that I meet at the store and the, uh, when I go on a walk, you know, um, <laughs> very extra copies and like you just pass them out. <laughs> exactly. Right. Like you look like you could use some of this. <laughs> um, yeah, we, we oh. got one of those neighborhood little, little library things. In our there you area. go. Oh. Keep it stuck. I'll, I'll go stick this in there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we'll put the, you, you went through a reading list. We'll put that on in the notes so people can check out uh, those books you recommended. Um, but man, if you have, if you haven't read any of them, start with why we can't wait by Martin Luther King Jr. And Nicole, where, where could people find more of your writing and stuff? What's your uh, website and stuff? Yeah, you can, uh, I have a website, NicoleMcGlore.com. And then my blog is called Give the Grave Only Bones. We can talk about that story some other time. But yeah, I, uh, I am nice verbally, you know, when I talk, I'm very nice. So if you feel like my writing is a little intense, I just, I'm warning you now. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. Whose bones are you putting in the grave, Nicole? <laughs> Yours, Nate. Yeah. That's, that's... <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. I, I highly the... recommend the blog, by the way. I was a yeah. secret, secret follower until it gave me the badge and I got, I, I ducked away, but, uh, <laughs> I strongly recommend that. So first read why we can't wait and then just follow the blog for more tips. Fantastic. Yeah. All right. Well, hopefully maybe we'll have a, a come up with an excuse to have you on again. I, I love hearing what you have to say. It's great. Thanks for having me. I'm, I'm really, this was great. Thank you so much. See you later. Thanks. But it only takes a whisper. Hey, thanks for listening to following the fire. If you'd like to see show notes for this episode, which includes links to everything we mentioned as well as all the scriptures, head on over to followingthefire.com and just click on this episode. There's also contact information on the website. Let us know what you think about the show and if you have any suggestions for future topics. Also, please give us a review on Apple Podcasts if you could. It really helps other folks find the show. And as always, thanks to the fabulous Daniel Wheat for the theme song and the music for the episode. You can find more of his stuff on Apple Music and Spotify. See you later.